And let's worship God in the giving of tithe tonight and offerings. Brother Jose, if you help us today, please, sir, to receive the tithe and the offering. All grateful, born-again Christians who know the goodness of God, honor God back in return with a portion of the finances he's blessed us with. Brother Jose, would you pray, please, sir? Heavenly Father, we're thankful for our being here tonight. Bless the offering uh, that we can eat here in your house in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you tonight as you honor God and He honors you in return. Second Kings tonight. Second Kings. And after service tonight, we'll have a cleanup, cleanup slash practice going on. If I'd to be part of that, that'd be great. Getting the house of God ready for tomorrow. Second Kings tonight, chapter 20. We're going to start, we're going to look to verse number four. Second Kings chapter 20, verse number four. And... We got the situ the heaters set up a certain way now, to where we're, it's kind of like the warm section and the cooler section. So if you're hot, move to the back. If you're a little bit cold, move a little forward. This is trying to create two different sections. Naturally, throughout the winter, you have little pockets of cold. So we're trying to create more of a zone, you know, some heating zone and a cool zone and a kind of in between zone. So if you find that spot, then that's great. And so 2 Kings chapter 20 tonight, verse 4. And it came to pass after Isaiah was gone out into the middle, middle court that the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer and have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord. Let's pray tonight. Brother Philip, would you pray, please, sir? Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here safely, Lord God. As we receive this message, let our hearts be open to you, Lord God, not on anything in this world. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 Our title tonight, Don't Waste What God Has Given You. Amen. Don't waste what God has given you. Now, Hezekiah was known as one of the better kings of Judah. And if you know your biblical history, you know that there was a time when the nation of Israel was split because of the foolishness of King uh, Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. He would not take the counsel of the elders. He took the counsel of his peers. And when, uh, when the people of Israel came to him, apparently led by Jeroboam, they said to him, if you will lighten some of our burdens, then we'll serve you. Because Solomon had made their burdens grievous, many of them. And uh, Rehoboam said, come back in three days, we'll talk about it. At first, he went to the elders and they said, you should do this. You should lighten their burdens because, uh, and they will serve you. And these elders, these counselors were the ones who were under uh, the uh, kingship of Solomon. And so I'm sure they offered their perspective to Solomon. But let's face it, when you're Solomon, you don't need a whole lot of perspective given to you, right? The most, when you're the wisest man on the whole earth, and God is the one who directly gave, directly gave you his wisdom, you might not fully need all the counselors. But, the, but then Solomon is the one who wrote what? That there's, that there's wisdom in having lots of counselors, and there's protection and safety in many counselors and so even he understood let me get some perspectives here 
and Solomon. But his son Rehoboam went and asked the elders who were under the, the uh, kingship of King Solomon, giving their insight and no doubt receiving wisdom from him. And they said, yes, you need to do this thing. And then he went to talk to his buddies who grew up with him, his peers, and they said, forget that. Tell them there's more manhood in your pinky than in your, whole, your dad's whole body. And guess who he listened to? He listened to his peers. He listened to his peers. He had YLS. You know what YLS is? It's a, YLS is a deadly syndrome. Young leader syndrome. <laughs> he had young leader syndrome. And so young leaders, they want to be accepted. They want to be cool. They want to be liked. Many of them have a hard time leaving the fold of their peers and leading their peers. And so he was one of those who could not leave the fold and lead his peers. He wanted to be cool with them while he was the king. And then that's how the kingdom became split. That's how the kingdom became split. And, and you had 10 tribes in the north. You had uh, really three tribes in the south because the Levites went to the south, to the southern kingdom, and stayed with the, with the household of David. And so the kingdom was split. And I know that there were, thir there were only 12 tribes, but really there were 13, if you look at the way that the genealogies are listed out, and how that the sons of Joseph were named. And so that's a whole teaching in itself. And so uh, during this time, Hezekiah was the king of the southern kingdom of Judah. And he's known as one of the kings who did right as unto the Lord. 2 Kings 18, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, son of Eli, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. 25 years old when he began to reign, he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also is Abi, the daughter of Zechariah, verse 3. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. So we know that Hezekiah started off right. But there apparently came a point at which Hezekiah's way of living for God and his reverence for God changed. It changed. And we're going to look into this and see what happened in the life of Hezekiah. This man who feared God started off right, did everything, uh, as the Bible shows us anyway, according to King David. And then toward the end of his life, something changed and he became very evil. And we're going to learn from his life tonight. We're hoping we'll learn from his life and realize that just because we may start off well for God doesn't mean it will end well if we don't put the right effort into serving God. Number one, let's talk about how that God had blessed Hezekiah. Back in 2 Kings 20, God had blessed him. Verse 2. Now, there was a point at which Hezekiah got sick. And the Lord said, you're going to die. Chapter 20, verse 2. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked with, before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. So God had just told him in verse 1, God told him through Isaiah, Tell Hezekiah you're going to die. In verse 2, Hezekiah begins to pray. Verse 3, he tells him there, remember what I've done for you, Lord. Remember my life. Verse 4. And it came to pass of four Isaiah, or before Isaiah was gone out into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again, tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people. Thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day thou shalt go up to the house of the Lord. And that's where we started this message, is right there. So whenever Hezekiah was sick, God, and God was determined to let him die, Hezekiah prayed and God hearkened unto him and dealt with Isaiah's heart to go back and tell him God had repented. As I've shared before, I'll share it tonight. Often when we hear the word repent, we think of repenting from sin. But that's not what the word repent means. Repent simply means to pull back from something and change your mind about it. That's what repentance is. And if you pull back from something and change your mind, then your direction will change also. It isn't just a change of direction because you can change directions and then turn around again and go right back to it if your mind wasn't made up. 
But when you pull back and change your mind, then changing directions is what naturally follows. So God repented from his decision. He pulled back from it. He relented. He changed his mind about it. And he was determined to let Hezekiah live. Now, there is still power in prayer. Amen. Amen. There's still power in prayer. Amen. Healing of the body. Absolutely. Healing of the mind. More important. Healing of the soul. More important. Healing of our standing with God. More important. Because God isn't a mean God just because it doesn't heal a body. But because we need to have our souls uh, healed. We need salvation. We need our standing with God healed. Jesus even said, you can go to heaven lame and, and, and maimed and broken. He said, it's better to go to heaven like that than to have a healthy body and be cast into hell. And so God is not a mean God if he doesn't physically heal us because he has not, he has not committed himself to do that. He has committed himself to heal us spiritually only if we would seek him for it. Now, God had a bigger purpose in healing Hezekiah. And that bigger purpose we're going to look at tonight. It's a good lesson for us to learn. When we seek God, he will be found of us. Jeremiah 29, 13, he says there, if you seek with all your heart, I will be found. Amen. I'll be found by you. You can make your petitions known. But you always leave the outcomes to God to decide. That's true submission right there, church. True submission to God is, it's okay. I'm going to make this known to God. I'm going to make my desires known. I'm going to pray, but I will leave the outcomes to God. That's true submission. Next, Hezekiah took his blessing for granted. This is where we're getting closer into what we want to talk about tonight. He took his blessing for granted. Verse 12. At that time, Barodach Baladon the son of Baladon, king of Babylon. So if you're working on a Christian rap song, you can use that one right there, right? Barodach Baladon, the son of Baladon, king of Babylon. <laughs> I just need somebody scratching, uh, some, mixing some records behind me. All right? All right. He sent letters and a present unto Hezekiah. Just a quick funny thought that came, came to my mind. I wonder if Barodach Baladon always made his servants address him that way, just because he liked the way it sounded. Only if they spoke English. All right. He sent letters to Hezekiah, for he had heard that Hezekiah had been sick. Now remember who, who this is now, the king of Babylon. And Hezekiah hearkened unto them and showed them all the house of his precious things, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious ointment, and all the house of his armor. And they didn't even need a balloon to find it. And so all the house of his armor and all that was found in his treasures, there was nothing in his house, nor in all his dominion, that Hezekiah showed them not. Then came Isaiah the prophet unto king Hezekiah. So what had just happened? The king of Babylon sent a gift. You're sick. I'm glad. You, I, I, I want to send my well wishes unto you. What did he do? Come on over to my house. Come on over to my armory. Come on over to where everything is that's precious. Let me show you how much silver and gold I have. Verse 14. Then Isaiah the prophet said unto Hezekiah and said unto him, or then came Isaiah the prophet to Hezekiah and said unto him, What said these men, and from whence came they unto thee? See, the prophet knew something was wrong. See, the preacher was asking something very specific. The Bible says in Ephesians that God gave us these ministers as a gift to us so that they can shepherd us. So that they can shepherd us. And I know that sounds self-serving, but I'm, I'm, I'm beyond worrying about that because I have shepherds also. Because I have shepherds. And I just figure that if I can abide by my shepherding, so can I can teach that also as a shepherd. And so therefore, this shepherd came to him and said, what were those men asking you? Where did they come from? And Hezekiah, he didn't say none of your beeswax. He didn't say that. I don't even know if that was a phrase back then. But he didn't say none of your business. Okay. He told him. Verse 15, he said, what have they seen in thine house? Rather, uh, let's, get, let's skip something here. These men from whence came they, Hezekiah said, we're in verse 14, Hezekiah said, they are come from a far country, even from Babylon. And he said, What have they seen in thine house? 
And Hezekiah answered, All the things that are in mine house have they seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not shown them. Now, the Lord had told him that I'm going to give, him, give you 15 years. So I'm going to add to your life 15 years. And that you will not die. 2 Kings chapter 20 is a good reason for God not to tell us when we're going to die. Right. Hezekiah knew he had 15 years. I'm not going to, God told me 15 years. God's not a liar. So what did he do? Did he get closer to God and serve God with great vigor and zeal and energy more than he ever had before in those last? I'm going to make these last 15 years count. Absolutely not. What did he do? I got 15 years. Come on, king of Babylon. Let me show you what I got in my house. And so he said, I've shown him everything. He invited the enemy in, probably thinking it wouldn't be that bad. Verse 6. I will add unto thy days 15 years. He knew how long he had. Human nature likes to push boundaries. Push boundaries. And not in a good way either. There are some boundaries that need to be pushed. But there are some boundaries that don't need to be pushed. And one of the greatest boundaries that don't need to be pushed is our boundary with God. Amen? Is our boundary with God. And so Hezekiah... Started off well with God. As a matter of fact, he was able to change God's mind through prayer. That's pretty good, right? But then when he knew 15 years I got, he drew back and began to push boundaries with God. And what does our mind tell us naturally? I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> wouldn't have been me, I would have done that. God can tell me when I'm going to die, I won't do that. We ought not speak until we've been in a situation, right? We've never been in that situation. And so God gave him 15 years. And he would waste these 15 years. And one of the first things that he seems to have done, come on over, sinners. Come on over, ungodly. Come on over, unbelievers. Come on over, people I have no business interacting with when I don't have to. Come on over. Look at my house. Look at everything I've got. These weren't just ungodly sinners. These were people who hated God. Israel hated them. Maybe he thought God had mercy on me once. He'll do it again. If anything bad comes of it, God showed mercy on me one time. He'll show mercy on me again. Now you notice one thing God didn't tell him. You're going to be happy and healthy for these 15 years. He didn't say that, did he? 15 years. I believe Hezekiah is the one who automatically assumed I'm going to be healthy and rich. I'm going to be happy and all my enemies will flee before me. So I can just invite them into my house. Brother and sister, we got to be careful not to invite undue ungodliness into our homes. And when I say home, I don't just mean the physical house, though that applies. But it starts with the house of our hearts. Because anything we do outwardly always started inwardly. Amen. It always started inwardly. If God blesses us, do not take it for granted. Do not waste it. There are lots of things, prosperity, material blessings, health blessings, all kinds of things that we can get so used to that we begin to take it for granted. We begin to take it for granted. And it may be that God lets us go 40 or 50 years with not a whole lot of problems every day in that grateful Christian's heart. They ought to be saying, thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Well, God hasn't taken it away yet. That's not how we think. I say, thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you for everything. Your, your life is a blessing not to be taken for granted. Your gifts and abilities are blessings that should not be wasted in sin and should not be taken for granted or serving self. God gave us a voice to praise Him with and to use to bring others to Him with. Amen. I'm, I'm trying to talk about things tonight that we can easily take for granted. We're, to, we're used to talking. We're used to vocalizing. We're used to our vocal, uh, vocal abilities just to be able to converse. Yes. But what would we do if that were ever taken from us? See, it's hard for us to think about something so simple. But even the simplest things, let's not waste it. Amen. Amen. Let's not waste it. Amen. There were consequences. Verse 16. 
And Isaiah said unto Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Now Isaiah is getting ready to make a prophecy that he believes would affect Hezekiah. Verse 17. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, look at them now, he's telling them, you're going to have more kids, shall they take away, they'll take away those sons. And they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Certainly, if I tell you, Hezekiah, that it's, go that it, it's going to affect everything your ancestors worked for. And certainly, if I tell you, Hezekiah, it's going to affect your kids. Certainly, you would care. What is Hezekiah going to tell him? Good is the word of the Lord, verse 19. Good is the word of the Lord, which thou hast spoken. And he said... Is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? Oh, how selfish. As long as it's good while I'm alive. But isn't that how selfish human nature is? It absolutely is. I'm not worried about what my ancestors did. I'm not worried about how they had to come across the wilderness. I'm not worried about those who did not enter in because of unbelief. I'm not worried about all the, thing, all the land that they had to take. I'm not worried about that. They say that after about the second or third generation, you end up losing that which was fought for. It only takes a few generations. And so Hezekiah said, as long as it's good in my day, not worried about what my ancestors did for me, not worried about what happens to my, to my kids or my grandkids and on and on. So he said, the word of God is good as long as it's good with me. He had a whatever happens, happens as long as I'm happy mentality. If we're not careful, we can fall into that. Now we're talking about somebody who did, who was actively doing right. I mean, spent years doing right. Just to fall out toward the end. His wasting of God, his wasting of what God had given him also had negative effects on others. The Bible says that we are not an island to ourselves. The way it says it, no man liveth to himself, no man dieth to himself. We always have a ripple effect on someone. Over in chapter 21, let's read about probably one of the most horrendous effects that this had, and that was upon his son Manasseh. Manasseh, which was also the name, the name of one of, of Joseph's eldest son. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign and reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hephzibah, which is the name of a little country town in Georgia too, by the way, where we lived when we passed it near at Camp, what was it, Camp uh, Fort Gordon, Augusta, Georgia area, Hephzibah. His mother's name was Hephzibah. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Who did? Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Now I was thinking about this earlier, I think it was today, either today or yesterday, but I believe it was today, how that Hezekiah named his son Manasseh. Now Manasseh was a, it was a relatively regular name in Israel. But wonder if he thought, because, because the prophecy went forth to him before Manasseh was born. So apparently, this transgression happened within the first three years of the 15-year extension. Because Manasseh became king when Hezekiah died, and Manasseh was 12. So he was only alive for the last 12 years of the 15-year extension, which means his transgression with Babylon must have happened within the first couple of years. In other words, it didn't take long. It didn't take long for him to start transgressing God. And so maybe he thought, well, if I name my son after one of the sons of Joseph, whom God blessed, then maybe God will be pleased with that. If I name my son after uh, one of our ancestors, is there anything wrong with that? Of course not. But he was trying to use, 
I'm not saying he was, but just the thought came to me as I was thinking about this. Knowing that he had transgressed God and knowing that God's judgment was coming, maybe he thought, well, if I name my son after one of the people God blessed, then maybe God will have mercy. Maybe God will be happy. If, if we are going to purposely transgress God, it takes more than just a little simple act of penance to try to, to cover for that. See, Hezekiah, what he needed was a change of heart. He needed his heart changed. He had done right before, but he had gone to evil. He needed a heart change is what he needed. He didn't need just a little, uh, a little uh, pat on the head from God. Look, God, I named my son Manasseh after somebody that you blessed. He didn't do that. Now, why didn't he name him Ephraim? Why didn't he name him Ephraim? Well, Ephraim was a uh, nickname, or not a nickname, but it was a second name of the northern part, Israel. And they were at odds at one with another, Judah and Israel, Samaria, Ephraim. The northern kingdom had three names, Samaria, Ephraim, and Israel. So I, I, ain't gonna name, I, don't, I don't love God that much. All right? I don't love my son that much. I'm not going to name Ephraim because that's another name for Israel. And we're not in good standing with Israel right now, the northern kingdom. So I'll name him Manasseh. I'll name him Manasseh. It takes more than just a little, here you go, God, just a little nice little thing I'm doing for you. It takes more than that to repent. Amen. Amen. It takes more than that. I'm not saying that happened. I'm just saying that that's what came to my mind as I was thinking about it. And given the character of, he of, of, uh, of uh, Hezekiah, given the character of Hezekiah, might not be too far off. Verse 2, speaking of Manasseh, he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Verse 3, for he built up again the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed and he reared up altars for Baal and made a grove as did Ahab king of Israel who was Ahab, husband of Jezebel, remember that teaching? Uh, just like Ahab did king of Israel worshipped all the host of heaven, served them, verse 4, and he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord said, In Jerusalem will I put my name. Altars unto whom? Unto God? No, unto Baal, verse 5. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. So he's already, he's already breaking the first two commandments. No other gods before me do not bow down to images. Graven images, verse 6. And he made, him, he made his son pass through the fire, so he was okay with late-term abortion and after-birth abortion, which is murder all, all the way around. Made his son pass through the fire, observed time, so there's witchcraft, used enchantments, there's magic and all of that, black magic and the rest of it, dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. He wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. In other words, it not only provoked God to anger, but it seemed as if he was doing it on purpose. What did I just teach you about? What was it, Thursday night? Uh, about that, or was it, I think it may have been Tuesday, actually, about the uh, antilogia, the opposing word, the people who purposely uh, oppose things. They're not just a natural uh, disagreement where nobody really, either one is fine or whatever the case, but a purposeful disagreement just because you did it, I will immediately do the opposite. Well, that's what, uh, that's what Manasseh seems to have been doing. The Bible says to provoke him to anger, the Lord to anger. It doesn't say, and it provoked the Lord to anger. It doesn't say that. It says he did all these things to provoke him to anger. That's a totally different spirit, isn't it? Manasseh was 12, born in the 15-year extension. He was prophesied by Isaiah. Manasseh saw the careless attitude his whole life that Hezekiah had portrayed. He saw this wickedness of Hezekiah. All Manasseh had known was hypocrisy. That's all he had known. See, at least Hezekiah, at least Hezekiah had his own history of serving God to look back on. But all Manasseh had known was this hypocrisy of Hezekiah. And about 12 years old is where kids start getting their cynical, is where cynicism starts setting in, right? That's when, because they're transitioning toward teenage land and all that stuff. 
and that's where they start, you know, kind of getting their own personalities and their own little whatevers and and attitudes, yes. But you know, we know that they with discipline that can be checked and all that. I'm not going there tonight. But what I'm saying is, but it's natural in the heart because God put it in there. God put it into humans on or about 12, 13, 14 to start developing their own uh, their own. Yes, personalities, their own ways and their own preferences and opinions and their own independence. Their own independence. Because not long after that, 17, 18, 19, 20, whatever, they're getting ready to go out and live an adult life. And they've got to live among their peers. And this is why at five years old, they're okay with mommy and daddy giving them kisses, but not at 15, 16, 17. <laughs> because there's just a natural thing there. They're getting ready to move out into adult life. And so Manasseh was 12. Now he was 12. He was getting to that age where he was starting to see what was what and develop his own opinions. And we see that he really did not value the things of God because Hezekiah wasn't the valuing the things of God. And I'm bringing this teaching out tonight because I believe that we can all, you know, even whether we have kids or not, we can learn this. We can learn from this. That just because we start off good doesn't mean we're going to end good just because we started good. Amen. It's not a guarantee. Hezekiah did more for God than we will do. He tore down altars. When's the last time we went around tearing down altars to the false gods? And there's some places in Korea you could probably find them. You go over to places like Thailand, they got them all over the place. And, and then other places too. How many altars have we torn down? Not too many, right? Why? Because we're afraid to go to jail. Well, he was the king, so he could do these things. And so he did a lot more than we will probably ever do. And yet, there at the end, at the time of life where you would think, all right, I've got 15 years left. I know it for a fact. God, is, God told me. God has been good to me all these years. I'm going to pay it back as much as I can for these last 15 years. He did not do that. It sounds to me like he had only been serving God from personal gain. From personal gain. I don't want to go to hell. That's a good place to start. But it may be that he was serving God because I want God's blessings on my kingdom. I want God's blessings on my kingdom. Me, me, me. You know what brings out our true intentions? Whenever crisis sets in, crisis will, will absolutely reveal what we are, but also whenever convenience comes in, it was convenient for him to know I got 15 years, man, 14 years, 11 months and 29 days and on day number 30, I'll repent. But isn't that how a lot of people think? I'll make it right at the end. Well, we see right here a man who was right in the beginning and didn't make it right at the end. And he knew when he was going to die. Don't waste what God's given you. Don't waste. The Bible says there are such things as riches and whatnot. It can take to itself wings and fly away. And so there may be things you have today that you may not have them next year. You may not have them next month or next year. Don't waste what God has given you. Sit for me to come on to the music, please. So Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, he saw these things, and that's all he knew. That's all he knew. And he probably despised religion because of it. He probably despised religion. I've seen people talk about how they, once they got away from religion, then they were free. Well, they weren't free because there's going to be a payday someday to their sin. So they're not free. But what they, what, they, what they are saying, what they think they're saying, I got away from all the responsibilities and all the obligations and all the keeping up a show over here while I really live like this over there. In other words, being fake and phony. And the person, I know who they are, because of what they saw growing up, I can't really blame them. I can't really blame them. Okay? I'm not going to give any details because maybe perchance they may watch, who knows. But knowing what they saw growing up, I can't blame them. And all I can do is pray and try to show forth the best example I can that Christianity is actually a very substantive and fulfilling and joy-filled life. 
and, and there's just, it's just an amazing experience being set free from the bondage of the influence and power of sin and having the power of God in your life every day. Amen. All I can do is show forth and talk about it, how happy it makes you and how joyful it makes you and how fulfilled it makes you. And that's all I can do. And then I pray that God would one day change their hearts. And that's what I pray for them. Manasseh was in such, just such a situation. And this may not apply to us as pertains to, you know, kids and family members. But what about those who see us in our community or at work? The people we tend to forget all about. Don't waste what God's given you. It's very easy to do that. And for some of us, God has given us a lot. Amen. He's given us a lot. Let's not waste it. Let's bow our heads tonight. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much, God, for just helping us. And Lord, we can just take so much for granted sometimes. But we ask you, Lord, to help us not to do that. Help us to have the right mentality. Because sometimes we don't. Sometimes we just take it for granted, Lord. But we ask you, Lord, to help us to think the right way. That we may just focus on you and give you glory all the days of our lives. And Lord, if, even if you were to show us how much longer we have to live, help us to have the right heart that wants to celebrate you all those days. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. Let's live like we've only got a few moments left, and let's work like we've got a hundred years left. And give it all to God. God bless you. Let's find a place to pray.